Uh, thank you, Clark, and I want to thank you again for assembling such great panels. Every year you uh, get uh, newsmakers and future newsmakers uh, to serve on these panels. Last year, for example, I served on a panel with Paula Broadwell. Um, uh, we went on, and while I don't expect any of our distinguished panelists to be making news quite like that this year, I think they'll all be in the spotlight in some form or another. Um, very quickly, um, uh, to my left, Raj Day is the general counsel of the National Security Agency, which puts him right in the hot seat of all the issues that uh, have been um, at front and center since the Snowden uh, disclosures. Before, uh, before that, Raj was the uh, uh, staff secretary for the president. Uh, president Obama, and my understanding is that gave him access to everything that went to the president's desk, which is uh, pretty um, um, uh, ominous when you think about it. But, uh, and uh, I first encountered Raj when he was a counsel for the 9-11 Commission uh, investigating what, went, uh, uh, what happened there. Um, to his left, Neil McBride is the U.S. Attorney for uh, uh, the Eastern District of Virginia, and uh, uh, which has put him at the forefront of investigations on terrorism and uh, quite a few media uh, leak investigations, leak investigations involving the media. A subject I want to get to on this panel. Before that, he was a um, he served in the Justice Department in the DAG's office and was a uh, counsel to then Senator Joe Biden. Uh, Jay Johnson was the the general counsel for the Defense Department uh, until last year. Um, and that gave him uh, a legal overview about everything the U.S. military and the Defense Department was doing, a lot of which are the matters we're going to discuss here. Before that, he was a general counsel for the Air Force and, I, uh, and an assistant U.S. attorney, uh, I understand, hired in New York by Rudy Giuliani. Um, back in the day that he was uh, served on that. Uh, Jane Harmon needs no introduction to anybody here. She's now the executive director or director of the Woodrow Wilson Center, served for how many terms in Congress? Nine. Uh, nine terms in Congress, was ranking uh, a, a member on the House Intelligence Committee for many years and then the Homeland Security uh, Committee. And um, Anthony Romero is the executive director of the ACLU and has been a consistent voice for civil liberties on all the issues we're going to talk about. So let's start right off um, uh, with the NSA program. I know um, uh, some of it was covered in the previous panel, but I want to get into with Raj a little bit how it actually works. And I'm talking about the metadata uh, program, which was probably the biggest disclosure by Edward Snowden. The fact that uh, millions and millions of records of Americans' phone calls were being um, uh, collected slash stored, I'll let people use the word they want, uh, by the NSA uh, under a provision of the Patriot Act, Section 215. Um, Raj, walk us through exactly how this program works in practice, who has access to it, what those records can be used for. Sure. Uh, well, thanks, Mike, and thanks to the Aspen Institute and to Clark for pulling this all together. Um, I'm especially appreciative because I, what I wanted to start out with is that I firmly believe that the U.S. government, the intelligence community, NSA in particular, needs to be as transparent as possible, consistent with our need to protect national security. And obviously, it's that last piece that's the rub, and it makes it so difficult to talk about classified programs. But I would like to be as informative and helpful uh, in this discussion as possible. So with that, um, and the reason I say that is my job as the general counsel is to make sure our activities are lawful. But I think that the legitimacy of NSA's activities is just as important as the lawfulness of its activities. So uh, let me turn to the, the program you asked about, Mike. Even on the prior panel, there was some conflation between the two major programs that were exposed. There are a number of, of issues that have been out in the press lately, but there's two major programs that were exposed. One, and I'll refer to them as the 702 program and the 215 program. Just to put it to the side, the 702 program is about the collection of content of communications, emails and phone calls, but may only be targeted at non-US persons reasonably believed to be located abroad for a valid foreign intelligence purpose. That is not what we're talking about with respect to the 215 program to target the contents of the communications of a U.S. person under FISA anywhere in the world, whether it's in the U.S. or in the forest flung corner of the world, requires a showing of probable cause to a federal judge. Turning to the 215 program, we call it the 215 program because it's 
conducted pursuant to Section 215 of the Patriot Act. That provision allows the director of the FBI to apply to the FISC to obtain uh, business records that may be relevant to an authorized national security investigation. The FBI uses this provision for lots of different things. The only program that NSA uses it for in connection with the FBI is the business records metadata program that we're discussing today. So what is that program all about? Before I get into the details, I think it would be helpful for everyone to understand what's the point of the program and why did it evolve. So in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks, one of the major issues that was exposed was a seam between our foreign intelligence collection and our domestic counterterrorism efforts. People in shorthand refer it to it as the foreign domestic divide. The 9-11 Commission, for which I served as a staff member, focused on this issue, and the U.S. government over the past decade has taken a number of efforts to address this divide. Some of them institutional, like setting up the National Counterterrorism Center, and some of them utilizing certain programs, like the Telephone Metadata Program. The idea behind the program is to help connect when there's a foreign threat that may have a domestic nexus. So how does it work? This program is about the bulk collection of telephone metadata, and what that means is things like numbers dialed, date and time of call, and duration of call. It does not include any subscriber identifying information. There's no names associated with the numbers that are submitted to the FBI and to NSA. There's no locational data that is provided, whether that's GPS data or cell site locational information. And most importantly, and probably most obvious, there is no content. I say that just so that everyone has a level set on the facts here. As to how it's implemented, uh, pursuant to court order, this data comes to NSA on a daily basis. It needs to be put pursuant to court order in a segregated database, so it can't be commingled with other data at NSA. It has strict access and use controls that are imposed by the FISC. And so let me walk through some of those for you. Well, can I, can I just, sure. I, I want to get back to this, but you, you talked about transparency here and understanding. And I want to, and this is called the 215 program because of the provision in the, in the Patriot Act. Jane, you were in the Congress when it passed the uh, Patriot Act. And 215 was definitely one of the issues that people mm -hmm. were debating. Did you right. understand when you voted for and supported the Patriot Act that it would be used for the bulk collection of everybody's phone records in the United States? States. I understood that we needed to collect records in order to, through all the means we've discussed in prior panels today, in order to find those people in the United States or outside the United States uh, who were linked to people in the United States who were trying to harm us uh, after 9-11. And I voted for a provision that authorized people under strict supervision to figure out the best way to do that. I don't think as a sitting member of Congress and somebody, uh, I certainly know a lot about the intelligence business, but I'm not a trained intelligence analyst, that I'm the best person to decide the parameters of the program. But when I voted for it, one, Congress narrowed some of the initial proposals, and two, we sunsetted this thing. This thing has to be renewed every three years. And I, I, can I just add a little historical context, because I think it's important, and I think a lot of people here but do, I just want to do get not understand. Did you understand that it would be used for the purpose that Raj is, uh, is I understood. Well, here. business records are, could certainly be phone, All phone company records. The records. The, exactly how it would be implemented, uh, I, I trusted people to implement it fairly because those in Congress who were on the relevant committees uh, played, certainly I did, a major role in overseeing what was happening. Now my knowledge, I, I left the Intelligence Committee at the end of 2006, but then I headed the Intelligence Subcommittee of the Homeland Committee for another four years. So I stayed in this game. Did I, did I oversee every single uh, bit of it? No. Uh, do I think that maybe now, now that there's a much more public debate, Congress should narrow some of these provisions? Yes. Congress did narrow some of these provisions. There was the so-called library piece of 215, and there was a, a hue and cry about grandma going to the library and taking out a book, and who could see that? And the reason the library provision was added is that there are often internet uh, uh, internets at libraries, and in case anybody missed it, a lot of the way communication works uh, between bad guys to bad guys is through the internet, and those sites maybe 
ought to be subject to the provisions of Section 215. So once it was narrowed to clarify that grandma was exempted, uh, Congress did that uh, in, in response to public outcry. People have known about this program. It was revealed in the New York Times in 2005. George Bush then finally partially declassified it. And I learned for the first time, to my uh, extreme dismay, that in the first three and a half years of this program, um, which was developed by the Bush administration, the president had used his Article II authorities, he's the commander in chief, uh, to run the program rather than the provisions of law, FISA, which uh, Congress enacted in 1978. It's a fact you ought to all know. FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, was passed by Congress in 1978 in response to the abuses of the Nixon administration and the recommendations of the Church Commission. And it set up a careful system of a FISA court, which I think you all understand how that works, composed of federal judges and intelligence committees on the Hill, which were set up then to monitor these FISA applications. And it worked very well, in my view, uh, through 2011, 2001. And then the Bush administration yanked it and ran it a different way. Congress, after that, pulled it back under FISA. And I think, uh, I, I, I believe strongly that maybe the amount of metadata is excessive. I'm sure my buddy here, Anthony, thinks this. But, and, and that ought to be uh, debated. And maybe the program should be narrowed. But there has been robust oversight over these years. Uh, let me come back to Roger about the actual implementation, because I want to get back, I want to be very clear on this. Um, who can access this data and for what specific purposes? Certainly. And so uh, just to add one fact, because facts are always good, um, we sent a, I, I think this is in a letter that went to the Hill yesterday from mm -hmm. the Justice Department. White papers classified were sent to Congress in December of 2009 and February of 2011, expressly describing the bulk collection use of this program. I can't speak to um, any individual member of Congress currently now as to their knowledge of the program, but I, I think that fact is an important one. But getting to the use of the program, um, so uh, in terms of access, access is strictly controlled, and what does that mean? So in order to query the data, one has to have a reasonable, articulable suspicion that a particular selector, which is a phone number, um, has a tie to a specific terrorist group that's identified in a court order. So just a terrorist group. So if Neil McBride calls you up tomorrow and says, I've got a foreign espionage investigation going on right now, and I think my target might be about to leave the United States, I need to check out this phone number to see whether he's in communication with a co-conspirator. Are you going to give him the information from that data collection? No, it'd be illegal. You tell him no, he can't have that's it. Right. Not only Neil, would it, Neil no. how do you get the information? Ask again? <laughs> <laughs> Please? We're so friends, but not that close. But. How would you get the information for that investigation that you need? Um, well, the, uh, you know, let me, let me back up from the specifics uh, for, for, for a minute and, and quickly get to that. Mike. So in any um, investigation uh, post 9-11, the uh, uh, the, the FBI and the intelligence community and other government actors um, are, are working uh, seamlessly in a way that really didn't happen before 9-11. I mean, I, when, when Jay was uh, general counsel, we would have, uh, uh, there were weeks when we had many occasions when we had to talk. Um, we work uh, closely with, uh, the, with, with the military, with Admiral McRaven's community, with uh, Admiral Gortney down in, in Norfolk, uh, with, with various command forces. So there are, um, there are conversations occurring across uh, the defense intelligence law enforcement communities uh, in, in, in ways which are, which are helpful in terms of uh, permissible information sharing and, uh, and dot connecting. To your specific question, if there was a, uh, uh, as I understand your hypothetical, if there was an operational uh, terrorist uh, uh, within the United States, um, I would hope that we would already uh, have their number. And uh, not a terrorist, I said a spy. A spy. Um, well, uh, there certainly have been examples where there were individuals in this country. Uh, we've prosecuted a couple in my office just in the, the last year or so. One who was here as an unregistered agent of the mm. ISI from, from uh, Pakistani intelligence, another who was here um, at the behest of uh, Syrian intelligence. And um, those uh, individuals uh, came to our uh, attention, investigations ensued, um, and uh, we were able to obtain the, uh, no, no, the information. But, uh, but I'm asking a specific question about how you get records of phone numbers 
um, on ongoing investigations that have real time consequences. It could be a spy investigation, it could be a drug cartel that's importing guns onto the streets of Alexandria and were used in five murders in the last uh, several months. You need this information right away. And you want to know who's making phone calls to this, who, who's making these phone calls. How do you get the information? Well, it's, I think. You can get it, can't you? Yeah, and, and we do you, get it. And, and by and, a subpoena. Sure, by, by a subpoena from an informant, um, from, from any number of ways. Um, and so that, that in, in sort of garden variety criminal investigations, our ability to uh, identify where a, a uh, alleged bad guy uh, lives or their phone number uh, or their, their email address, our ability to find it is not all that uh, difficult. Not all that Before difficult we can... and not all that time consuming. You can get it pretty quickly. If you need it for an, uh, an ongoing op investigation, operational, somebody's about to leave the country, you need that phone number in order to get a search warrant. You can get it pretty quickly, can't you? Well, it, it, would, uh, it would depend on the particular case, but, but in contrast to what Raj is describing, which is sort of you know, macro issues and bulk collection, uh, your uh, example, I think, contemplates a known uh, individual who's been under the uh, scrutiny or the, the, um, uh, the, the view of, of law enforcement or, or other agencies. And so uh, at the micro level, it's, 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 um, uh, it has not proved to be a difficult thing in, in our investigations. So I guess the question, Raj, is since Neil can get the information he needs pretty quickly um, for a lot of really serious investigations that have operational components, why can't you use the same method for uh, the, uh, uh, the, inve the terrorism investigations that you're collecting this data for? So I think the question, uh, bigger picture is why can't the data just stay with the providers and then on a one-off basis go to them. Which right? is That's what happens when, when Neil needs them for his investigations. So just as a, uh, using a hypothetical example that I think will be helpful, instructive for me anyway, is this came about in part after the 9-11 attacks. We realized that one of the operatives who had been living in the U.S. for some time in San Diego, it turns out after the fact we learned, had been receiving calls from a known Al-Qaeda safe house in Sana'a, Yemen. So that's a, I think that's a good example to use here. So we know there's a Yemeni number, for example, that is a bad number, has a, a reasonable suspicion that is tied to a terrorist organization. If we wanted to, in short order, try to figure out where that number may be connected to other numbers in the US, because we may have intercepted under another program the content of that uh, communication to or from that number, the way that would play out in practice today, if, if we went with um, the traditional law enforcement model, would be to need to go to multiple providers to ask them to search what number that number had been in contact with. So as opposed to a subscriber of one of those companies, this would be a situation where they don't have the records handy for a Yemeni phone number. They would have to do a search against their records, against that number. So it's, it's different than this, the hypothetical you posited earlier. Um, so there's operational consequences there. Two, in order to do the sort of analytics that need to happen on that data, the data needs to be aggregated to most effectively do that in short time. And so with three different providers, that would also be additional step of bringing the data back, putting it together, and trying to analyze it in short order. And the third point I'd make is um, today, there's no legal obligation for any of these companies to hold on to their data. They do it for their own commercial purposes. That's why it's called the business records exception. So tomorrow, we could turn around and any of these companies could decide that in their business purposes, they don't want to hold on to these records. And so we could be faced with a situation which would equally impact the types of investigations Neil deals with um, where we wouldn't have the data readily available. So those are some of the things we'd have to think through if we went to an alternate model. Anthony, I, uh, I think uh, what I was getting at is probably what the ACLU has been saying, that there ought to be specific targeted requests for this information. Um, Raj has just said, well, that would create all sorts of problems. We don't know how long the phone companies would hold it for. Does he have a point? No. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's great to be back at Aspen, I should say that. I was last here debating uh, Alberto Gonzalez and John Yu, and now I'm debating friends who serve in an Obama administration or who have served, and so much has changed and so much has not changed. Um, and to be clear, to Raj's point, the program, whether it's legitimate in the public eye or legal, the answer it is illegitimate and illegal in our minds, both Section 215 and se Section 702. Let's break it down. The 215 standard is really, really important to read the words of the law, a statement of fact showing that there are reasonable grounds to believe that the tangible things, any tangible things that they concede, 
uh, are saw, are, that are, saw, are relevant to a foreign intelligence, international terrorism, or espionage investigation. Relevant. Now, it defies the knowledge or the understanding of the word relevant when you are collecting every single phone call, metadata, we'll get into metadata. How is that, how is that limited to relevance when you're saying we got all the phone numbers that are made to and from American citizens? I don't think of the word relevant that way. My training at Stanford Law School had me think that the training of relevance was a bit more circumspect than everything, right? Metadata. They say metadata is not content. Well, you know what? Metadata can give a lot of content. How long I stay on a phone call. How often I call my mother as she struggles with breast cancer. How often I struggle with my office. Who I call in the government whose private cell phones I happen to have, who I don't call at the office because we don't want a log of my phone call from me to blank official Justice Department, but I have a private cell phone because we want to keep that somewhat between us, right? That metadata, when compiled in complete information, can give you a very full picture of what my day is like, right? So I think that the Fourth Amendment does cover the, the protection of my metadata. Now let's also talk about Section 702, right? Phone calls from overseas, from foreigners, um, that don't have the same kind of uh, standards that we have under the 215 program. Well, foreigners call Americans. Let me give you phone numbers that I have in my Rolodex, in my Blackberry, over there, where they have my phone number and I have their phone number, and I have called them in my 13 years as director of the ACLU. I have direct phone numbers, cell phone numbers for Yasser Hamdi. You might remember him. He was the subject of a Supreme Court case. David Hicks in the Guantanamo. Mr. Alaki's father, Anwar Alaki, who was killed by the American government by drones, including his 16-year-old son, also an American citizen killed by drones. Let's get Jay into this game. Uh, I happen to have the phone number of Mr. Alaki's father in Yemen. I have Moazem Beg's cell phone number who was also at Guantanamo. I have the phone numbers for Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's wife and brother-in-law in Iran. We represent Mr. Mohammed in the 9-11 commissions, uh, the 9-11 the, the trials at Guantanamo. We have contact with his wife and his brother-in-law and Mr. al-Masri, who was also held, rendered, and tortured. Those are all individuals that I have legitimate phone numbers. These are all cases in which I have been involved with. I call them, they call me. As an American citizen, I have a right, an expectation, that my communications with individuals for which I am doing my zealous work to defend their rights ought not to be intercepted under any program. Now, if you were to tell me, Raj, that my communications have not been caught up in the NSA surveillance program and that none of these phone numbers I've made or phone calls I've made and that they've called me are not part of your vast database, I wouldn't believe you. Right because I actually think that these are exactly the types of people that you're targeting. I have a legitimate right to interact with these individuals, and I have a right and expectation of privacy that my communications ought not be intercepted by the government. Jay, the, uh, why can't um, um, Anthony communicate with his clients without you uh, collecting, you and your former job, and Raj and his current job, collecting the records of those phone calls? I would, I would say that Anthony absolutely can communicate with his clients. Uh, he has a right to do that. His clients have a right to do that. And I, I, look, I think, I, I disagree with Anthony to say the program is illegal. Uh, in his opinion, the program is illegal. Hopefully in the opinion of right. all three branches of government, the program is not illegal. And, you know, the people's representatives in Congress, the court, the FISA court, uh, and the executive branch all believe this program is legal. And it's important to, I think, to, to put in perspective two things. First, as was alluded to in a question to the prior panel, there is no expectation of privacy in mm -hmm. metadata by itself. The fact that 212-373-3093 makes a phone call to some number in the 202 area code is known to the, the telephone company and, and lots of other people. There is no expectation in the fact of that call and the duration of that call itself. Clearly there is an expectation of privacy in content for which you need a warrant. 
Second, the reality is that the NSA surveillance program is probably the most regulated um, national security program we have. The two programs that have been declassified that we're talking about are regulated by the executive branch. Um, uh, the, the, the congressional oversight uh, has been aware of how the executive branch has interpreted Section 215 uh, and the judicial branch because it has approved it. Uh, the, that branch, uh, that aspect of the judicial branch that has been designated by Congress to hear these applications have, has approved of the manner in which this program is being implemented. So there's the equilibrium. And if our national political leadership decides they want to change the equilibrium, that is their prerogative and their responsibility. I, I, want, to, I want to move the discussion along because uh, we've got a lot of other subjects to go to, but I have two more quick questions for Raj uh, on this subject. Number one, the Verizon order uh, that was disclosed by Snowden that sort of kicked off this whole controversy is due to expire tomorrow. Is the NSA seeking a renewal? I have nothing to say today about that. Will you have something to say tomorrow? I think, I think that there will be something to say tomorrow. Will it be modified in any way? <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow. I, uh, I, uh, nothing further I can say on that at the moment. Okay, nice uh, try, though. One more, one more I but that's, with, uh, we'll, we'll be back to you tomorrow in Michael, one form I, or another. I, I, I am impressed uh, with Anthony's Rolodex. Uh, 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 can I say something uh, in defense of Anthony? I, I yeah. want him to I, continue to love me. Um, I think there should be you. an expectation of, of, of protection of lawyer-client communications. Yeah. And that has always been uh, um, uh, the, uh, the tradition, and it is generally respected. There was a 1979 Supreme Court case, it was referenced this morning, uh, that upheld a Maryland Supreme Court decision that there is no constitutionally protected expectation that phone numbers called uh, will not be disclosed. That's the basis on which we're, we should begin to talk about this. But coming back to Congress, Congress can narrow uh, or, or the, 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 uh, uh, the whatever is the, the standard uh, to go before the FISA court to get an individualized warrant. That's what the Fourth Amendment requires. And there was a, something called the SAFE Act, which was proposed in 2005, which I, I am sure will be revisited, and I just put it out here since we're reading stuff. Uh, it would have provided, it would have required that the court uh, deal with, that, that the case deal with specific and articulable facts, creating a reasonable suspicion that a particular person is an agent of a foreign power before the phone records could be seized or monitored. And that's a tighter standard. And I think Congress will be looking at, in some near lifetime, tightening the standard. And I think that's totally proper. And I think we need a national debate about this. And it's, this, we're having one right now. Regardless but, but let's, of... Let's, reg let's, un let's unpack something for, for a moment. The 79 case I was referenced this morning and just now. Really quickly. Anthony. 1979. I mean, how many years has it been? Right? Think about it. It was a very primitive pen register. It would track only the numbers being dialed, but it didn't indicate which calls were completed, let alone the duration of the calls. The, our capacity to connect the dots on metadata is vastly different than what we saw in 1979. Let's let the court decide whether or not 1979, that decision, is relevant or uh, upholds this metadata program. That's exactly what the purpose of our lawsuit will be uh, that we filed. Now let's also unpack the three branches of government. Excuse me, and I know I love Jane, but you've got to forgive me. A pox on all the three branches of government. FISA court, come on. 12, just, 12 judges, 11 of them Republicans, right? No adversarial, all appointed by Ch Chief Justice Roberts. There's no one representing the privacy interests of the people. It's only the government who represents in the FISA court. 35 years of jurisprudence, three opinions published. All right, Anthony, you've baited me here. Is there any form of surveillance that the NSA can conduct sure. that you would approve of? Sure, absolutely. What? It's got to be focused on the subject of the, the surveillance. I mean, we could, the, the, the uh, probable cause. Who would approve it? I mean, we can talk about that, whether it's the well, FISA who, court. Who should, it, in yeah, secret. A revamped FISA court. Do you FISA accept court? that it has to be in secret? A, a revamped FISA court? Totally fine. 
There's no, even the Chief Justice of the FISA Court says, we need an adversarial process. That's what our court system's supposed to be like. There is no adversarial process. We need more transparency. Who's the adversary when, when, when the government goes in and says, you can we've got one. a phone number here that's being called by an Al-Qaeda operative in Pakistan. Be, we, can, need to, we need to see who that person is right away. Who's you, the adversary that can, goes before the court to argue? You can no, easily no, you appoint an ombudsman who's gonna be, whose job it is is to pr preserve and present the privacy rights of the individuals. It th should not be the ACLU. Okay. It could be a government official last, who's charged with it. Last that. question for now on this subject. Um, we can debate whether the privacy rights metadata are covered by the Constitution or not, but Americans do have an expectation that their public officials are going to tell them the truth. the truth. So when, in March, Senator Wyden asked the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, if you could give me a yes or no answer to the question, does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? And he answered, no, sir. Did anybody from the NSA come into your office and say, we have a problem here, the director has just misled the Congress and the public about what we're doing? I think, uh, let me make a couple of points, but I, I don't want to. What's the answer to that question? Yep, I'll give it to you. I uh, think he has a right to privilege to turn client communications <laughs> yeah. to I, I think uh, the first, the first uh, point is, the first one is just <laughs> facts, because I think um, yeah. facts are important in the questions as well Thank as the, you, as well as, as well you, the answers. Um, I agree with Jay. He's the director of national intelligence, not at NSA. So he's not my client, and I wouldn't advise him. But he was him. talking about what your agency was doing, um, is I think, doing. I think, um, and it's available on the public record, Director Clapper has sent a record, uh, a letter, to the Senate Intelligence Committee explaining what happened in that moment. After the disclosures. I think um, what I would say, and I don't want to speak to, I, I don't know and don't want to speak to what um, Director Clapper said, but I would say, as a general matter, when longtime honorable public servants make a mistake, Sometimes it's a mistake. However, I, the premise of your question is true. The public expects honest answers. I, Both of those can be true. Yeah, I would just add, I, I have the highest regard for Jim Clapper. I wish we could roll back the videotape and his answer had been, I cannot answer that question in a public setting. If we move into a classified setting, I will answer that question completely. Um, let's move on, because there are other subjects that we need to cover here. And um, uh, Neil, you've been at, uh, uh, very involved in leak investigations uh, by this administration. Your office has, has overseen quite a few. In fact, as has been widely reported, this Justice Department has br brought more leak prosecutions than any other in American history. And the record shows, with very little to show for it at this, uh, at this moment, you've got one, I think, uh, uh, success. Um, last week, when the Justice Department, Att Attorney General Holder issued his new guidelines for um, uh, the press and how it will handle leak investigations involving the press, and saying that many of the, uh, a few of the tactics and techniques that the Justice Department has used, the secret subpoena of the AP phone records, uh, the use of a search warrant to get private emails from a reporter under the pretext that he was an aider or better of uh, uh, violations of the Espionage Act will not be used anymore. Um, and in the last paragraph of their new statement, they said, of their new policy, they said, cases involving the unauthorized disclosure of classified information are inherently difficult to investigate and prosecute. They are time and resource intensive, uh, and they, uh, they require a careful narrowing of the university of individuals privy to the information and require proof of harm that may itself result in further harmful disclosures. It sounds like a recognition that much of what this Justice Department has been doing, including your office, has been misplaced. Not surprisingly, I didn't quite read it that way, Mike, but uh, <laughs> happy, to, uh, happy to, to answer uh, those questions. Let me step, uh, step back for just a, a, a second. It's, it's true my office, the Eastern District of Virginia, has been involved in, in several uh, leak investigations and prosecutions. The context for that is that, uh, for those of you perhaps from the West Coast who, who happily do not have to travel uh, east to the nation's capital, uh, the, the part of Virginia that my district covers is home to the largest 
footprint of, of the U.S. government uh, in the country. We're home to the Pentagon, uh, to the CIA, to much of the intelligence community. Uh, we have the world's largest uh, naval base down in Norfolk. We have hundreds and hundreds of uh, federal government installations scattered across our district. We have thousands of acres of, uh, of federal land. And um, that uh, partially means that we have a bit of a national security bullseye on our back. It also means that when there are uh, issues involving the uh, uh, the unauthorized disclosure of national defense information, which I'll talk about in a, a second, uh, which is a subset of a much broader group of, of classified information, um, that uh, w my district is, is just sort of the, uh, the, the obvious place to, uh, to, to bring the investigation. So just a bit of context um, uh, as, as to why we are frequently involved in these cases, number one. Number two, I think a little context um, in terms of numbers is, uh, is helpful. Um, uh, the numbers are not as large as, as um, some of the, the uh, numbers thrown out in terms of, of, uh, of, of various um, collection systems, but in the average year, the Justice Department brings between 50 and 75,000 investigations, opens 50 to 75,000 investigations. So in the last five years, uh, the Justice Department, uh, between the Criminal Division and the 93 U.S. Attorney's Offices, have, pro you know, conservatively, we've probably opened 250, 300,000 investigations. Uh, against that backdrop, there have been a half dozen or so um, investigations of the, uh, into allegations of the unauthorized uh, disclosure of national defense information. So I think it's helpful just to sort of put in context that there's a whole lot else we have that occupies our time and attention and our day jobs uh, beyond uh, this, you know, small but, but important aspect of, um, of enforcing the law. Um, just a last sort of data point before getting to Mike's specific question. So there's been much that's been written and talked about about the overclassification of, of information in the last decade since 9-11, and, and I think uh, there's really no daylight between people of all um, you know, all, all sides and, and, and viewpoints that uh, the government classifies too much information. I believe the president has called for a, uh, uh, a lower amounts of, of classification. That said, uh, when you're talking about leak investigations and prosecutions, we use that term really as a term of art because it, it's a common misperception that there is a federal statute somewhere that criminalizes the release of classified information. That, that is not uh, the case. There's lots of information that's classified that may even be sensitive that you read about in the papers every day. And it may uh, be an annoyance to government officials. It, it may cause you know, some level of alarm and concern by, by various constituents, but that doesn't mean that it's a violation of federal law. The, 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 the handful of cases that my office is focused on are a very small subset of the overall universe of classified information. And as, as the folks here on the panel know, that is referred to as NDI, National Defense Information. And so in order to uh, bring a criminal case for the unauthorized release of NDI, uh, it, it's a fairly high threshold. You need to show that this is information uh, that, is, that is critical to the national defense, uh, that the release of which uh, can, can benefit uh, a foreign government and or hurt uh, the United States. And so- Have um, you gone overboard, Neil? No, I don't, I don't believe we have. Um, I think that um, the, 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 the Attorney General and others have talked about the reason for the uh, increase um, in, in leak investigations. Again, against a, a backdrop that we're talking about a handful of investigations out of hundreds of thousands that have been done in the last uh, several years. But I think the reasons that have been given are, are a couple. Number one, referrals from the intelligence community, uh, community from uh, the CIA and others, uh, has increased in recent years. That, I think, is a reflection of a, of a couple of things, and I think there's general agreement about this. Number one, a whole lot more people have access to classified information today uh, than they did before 9-11, number one. Number two, there's been, uh, this has been uh, discussed on the Hill in various public fora, um, and I'm not uh, uh, tech savvy enough to use uh, technical terms here, but uh, you know, essentially, internal IT systems within the government and the private sector make it somewhat easier to be able to you know, determine who the source of a particular leak was. That's more, that, that is increasingly true today in a way that it wasn't 10, 15 years ago. And so the number of referrals to us 
from the intelligence uh, community has gone up. Neil, in one of those cases, Jeffrey Sterling, you've compelled, you've sought to compel the testimony of James Rise in the New York Times. Um, he has said absolutely under no circumstances will he testify, and he'll go to jail if he has to. You've appealed to the Fourth Circuit arguing there is no reporter's privilege period in criminal cases, and um, which does seem to be somewhat uh, at variance with the Attorney General's comments last week about the strong support for media shield law. If you prevail, uh, and uh, are you prepared to put a New York Times reporter, James Risen, in jail for refusing to testify? So let me say a couple things about that. Um, uh, <laughs> first of all, the, uh, the uh, the administration, including the Attorney General, strongly supports and, and has for several years uh, a media shield bill, which has been pending in Congress. In fact, you've got a pending argument, there is no reporter's privilege. You've, you've argued that to the Fourth Circuit. Right. And if you'll allow me, my understanding of the, um, <clears throat> of the reporter's privilege, uh, uh, reporter shield bill, which I'm told was actually reintroduced yesterday by Senators uh, Schumer and Graham, and a, a bipartisan bill has been introduced in the Senate which would codify the new uh, DOJ media regs, which I'll also get to in a second. But my understanding of that bill, and I haven't um, you know, read it carefully. I'm not asking about the bill. I'm asking about the case that your office is bringing. Right. But I, I, I think I heard in your question, is there an inconsistency that you support the media shield bill on the one hand and, and say that as a matter of law, um, that there's not an absolute right uh, for, for, for any person, you know, reporter, non-reporter, to, to not uh, provide evidence uh, of a crime. My understanding of that, that uh, shield bill is, is that it, it sets up a, a test where a federal judge, um, based on, on the type of case, is it a garden variety criminal case, is it a, a sensitive national security case, is, is it a terrorism case, um, would make certain balancing um, uh, tests. And, and the bill does not say that a reporter has no obligation to ever go into court and testify, is my understanding uh, of the bill, that, that a, a test would be applied and it is a very fact-specific determination. Um, but the media regs that, that you mentioned, Michael, uh, I think are, are, are really important and, and they're, they're significant and they, they certainly are going to change uh, the way we do, uh, uh, do business to some extent in these investigations. Um, those media regs were a reflection by the Attorney General that, um, you know, oftentimes in Washington and, and elsewhere, uh, policy debates are really uh, as much about means as ends. At many times, actually, there are share, shared ends that both sides agree to, but we may have uh, friendly disagreements about the means to achieve those shared ends. And so what the AG did over the last month or so was to have six or seven personal meetings sit down with 30 or 40 members um, of the Fourth Estate. Uh, to, to, to sort of roll up uh, his sleeves and hear, okay, what is, it that is, what is it that is giving you heartburn about the way we're doing business? What are the means that we have used uh, historically that uh, perhaps should, should, be, um, uh, should be revised? And there are a couple of them which are significant, and my, my, uh, I've not sort of canvassed the editorial pages uh, of the nation's uh, papers and magazines, but the response seems to have been more, uh, more generally positive to these, these new regs. I don't know your own view, Mike, but here, here are two uh, real big changes in terms of how we will do business. Number one, if the government, well, let me back up. Uh, it has always been the case that uh, seeking records or, or testimony or information from a reporter uh, is an absolute last resort. That, that has to, there has to be a compelling need for the investigation. If I can get the information through another source, I'm not allowed to go uh, ask the reporter a question or to uh, ask them to, to testify in the grand jury. So there's an exhaustion requirement which has been strengthened and, and it's more robust. Um, the Attorney General you know, himself or herself needs to, needs to now sign off. It's not a delegated down to somebody in the department. Uh, but critically, the department now, if, if we wish to issue a subpoena, you know, for CNN, you know, for a, for a tape of a, of a demonstration outside an embassy, and, and that is the usual situation in which we're subpoenaing Can records. Can I bring you back to Jeffrey Sterling and James Risen? Are, do you really want to win this case and be faced with the choice of whether you're going to put the reporter in jail? So the case is pending before the uh, Fourth Circuit, and, if you and win? as a result, I, it's, it's a hypothetical. Right? I, need, I need to wait to, <laughs> to, see what, uh, to, see what, to see what happens. All right. Um, uh, let's. Uh, we got. We do have uh, Anthony. Quickly, if you have can one I, other can point. I, I'm sorry. Can I just finish yeah. before Anthony's point? Okay. So, so here are the two big changes. Number one, if we if we're going to subpoena a, a reporter, 
uh, we now need to give advance notice to that reporter. And the reporter, uh, if, whether it's to the reporter directly, well, obviously you would have receipt of the subpoena, but if we're going to a third party, right. uh, we now need to tell the reporter, and then the reporter has uh, the ability to, to object, to come into court, to litigate it if they want, and a judge will work it out if there's a dispute, number one. Number two, um, and this, I think, is reference to uh, the, the, search warrant. the search warrant case. The search warrant to Google. So uh, it, it's, it's um, the, the new uh, reg says that unless a reporter is him or herself the target of the investigation, um, that there will not be a search warrant sought for emails, phone records, uh, uh, et cetera. And the AG has made very clear, the regs make very clear, that reporters are not going to be prosecuted ever for simply going about their uh, very important business of, of, of reporting so, on the news. Can, can we each speak for a second? Go, go. Oh. Very quickly, because oh, okay. we got a right. big but subject to cover. I mean, yeah. I is, served in, in Congress and focused, oh, do you want to go first? No, no, I just want to know what No, he, Anthony like. will rebut what I'm about to say. Right. No. And, and focused uh, on, on a lot of this for 17 years, and I still focus on it. I think the press is, by and large, very responsible. I personally participated in a few phone calls to, to heads of offices saying, please don't publish information about the XYZ program now. It would be harmful. Let's understand what harmful means. Uh, sources and methods, when revealed, can result in people dying. Yeah. They can also result in our capability going forward against a target, let's say the Iranian um, uh, nuclear program, being compromised. It is not okay, certainly not okay with me, uh, to have public, uh, published uh, information which reveals sources and methods. And I'm extremely worried about some of the Snowden stuff that hasn't come out yet, which may show some sources that we have uh, in, in our current uh, efforts to uh, keep America safe, and those sources could be killed. So let's understand that. That does not mean a reporter X should go to jail, Michael, but the context is uh, there's, there's a responsible press, by and large. Uh, I certainly respect that. I strongly support and did support the Press Shield Law. We have to find a better way to stop leaks of of material that compromise our sources and methods. Okay, I want to move on to another subject here that's very big and, uh, and, and important, and that's drone strikes and the future of our uh, war uh, on terror. Now, it has all been predicated on the authorization to use military force passed after 9-11, um, uh, which identified our enemy as Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and Associated Forces. Jay, you gave a major major speech in Oxford uh, last year looking towards the future, what the future is going to look like. But I am hung up still on that the phrase associated forces. Who are the associated forces of Al-Qaeda who are our enemy right now? Um, well, you're correct that um, for the last four years while I was in office, um, <clears throat> the interpretation of the AUMF that we adopted in the executive branch uh, referred to uh, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and associated forces. Um, that was an interpretation by the executive branch that was endorsed by the courts in the habeas litigation brought by Guantanamo detainees specifically to include the concept of an associated force. And it was also an interpretation of the AUMF that the Congress last year in Section 1021 of the NDAA embraced. There were some in Congress who believed, you know, we shouldn't just rely on the lawyer's interpretation of our prior statutory authority. Let's codify it expressly, which they did in Section 1021, which engendered some litigation. The Second Circuit yesterday vacated the injunction uh, in that case. When I was in office, and um, I, I want to point out that when we conducted military operations pursuant to that authority in places outside of Iraq and Afghanistan, like Yemen, the Horn of Africa, every strike was briefed to Congress after the strike. And I would talk regularly to the lawyers on the Armed Services Committee and the members about how we were construing that authority so that they understood how their statutory authorization was being applied. And so during the time I was in office, that authority generally worked 
uh, against core Al Qaeda, you know, Osama bin Laden being the most prominent example. Um, other members of core Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and Al Qaeda affiliated elements of Al Shabaab. So three. There are there were three associated forces when you were in office. Well, I don't know that I would. Those were the those were the three that I had the occasion to evaluate most often. There were other instances where I would conduct a legal evaluation of certain other organizations where we didn't go forward with a specific operation, but those were the three most prominent examples that were public that we regularly briefed to Congress. Now, you referred to my Oxford speech. Uh, I think that we are at an inflection point, as one journalist put it, where uh, we should no longer consider ourselves in a traditional armed conflict against Al Qaeda and affiliated groups. And I think Benghazi is a prominent example of what I'm talking about because you can't label the Benghazi attack as something conducted by Al Qaeda and associated forces. It was more of a, a mixed bag. And so in this uh, period where I think we're headed in a new direction, we need to evaluate in Congress what new authorities our counterterrorism professionals might need. And we're not just talking about drone strikes. We're talking about uh, ability to conduct national security interrogations, pre-Miranda, and other types of things that, that domestic law enforcement, that the intelligence community uh, should have to, to go forward with the, with the future so can, threats. Can, can I add something to this? I, I just <coughs> want to give a shout out to Jay, who has been fearless. This is not while he was in government and since in talking about this. Harold yeah. Coe is another example of somebody who has been fearless, and it's not easy. At the, at the Wilson Center last week, we had one of our national conversations about the AUMF, whether it should be mended or ended. And Bob Corker, a Republican from Tennessee, Senator, the ranking member on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, came down to the Wilson Center and said, Congress is being irresponsible. Uh, this statute, which I, uh, sitting here, voted for, every member of Congress but one voted for it in 2001, was never anticipated to be in effect 12 years later and be the basis for all of our uh, tactics against bad guys uh, forever and ever. And this is a debate Congress should have, and if Congress isn't having it, it's a debate the larger society should have about what is the basis uh, for our uh, going forward view uh, of, of who's attacking us and, and, and what, what tactics are appropriate and what's the narrative. Yeah. Let's not forget that. What does the United States stand for? So I, 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 I doubt anyone in this room really disagrees with that and I just think it's time to get on with it and I want to applaud Jay for what he has done to set the stage for that. Um, Jay, in, in uh, my colleague, my former colleague Dan Clydman's uh, excellent book, Kill or Capture, um, he describes you being briefed about a U.S. military drone strike in Yemen, uh, learning about it, and afterwards saying, if I was Catholic, I'd have to go to confession. What did you feel guilty about? Um, well, look, any time um, anytime I or any other national security official uh, has to sign off on th something that leads to lethal force. Uh, that should leave you with a heavy heart, yeah. period, uh, irrespective of who the objective is. And uh, I, I want to talk about the op-ed in the Times today, written yeah. by Mr. Alaki Sr. Senior. Um, I read it, and um, the reality is that in a congressionally authorized armed conflict, on occasion, uh, people who are not targeted by the strike are killed. Uh, the good news, to the extent there is any in armed conflict, is with our modern technology, um, we are more precise. Uh, collateral damage is, is minimized. Um, it's, and so our government in May, uh, because a number of officials, including the president, obviously believe that if the US government takes the life of a US citizen, uh, the government should acknowledge that, um, acknowledged uh, that the U.S. government was responsible for Mr. Alaki, for his son, and, and for others. And so, and, and the way the Attorney General put it, uh, they were not specifically targeted. Um, so uh, the point I want to make is that for any responsible 
official of, uh, of our government involved in counterterrorism, and there were a number of them in this room. Um, <clears throat> you, read a, you read an op-ed like that and you, you, get a, you get a pit in your stomach and, yeah. and you read it with a heavy heart. And if yeah. you don't, you should not be involved in making these decisions. Absolutely. Um, we have, uh, Anthony, I'm going to let you answer, but there are, there's limited time for questions from the audience, so if anybody wants to pose one, now is the time to do so. Um, uh, and I got one right over here. Uh, Harrison Monsky from Foreign Affairs Magazine. Um, the New York Times has likened the FISA court to an, quote, almost parallel Supreme Court in that it's issuing decisions and constitutional interpretations that will shape intelligence practices in the future. Should the FISA, do you agree with that characterization? Uh, should the FISA court be playing that role? Um, or should the Supreme Court be taking on some of those cases? Um, Raj. Uh, so the FISA court is operating as Congress established it in 1978. I think one important fact, I assume everyone knows how it operates. There are, these are federal judges, Article III judges. There is a federal uh, fifth court of review that has ruled, rarely, but it has. Um, I, I think the narrative generally that's out there is that the FISC is a rubber stamp. Um, so few applications are rejected. And there is a handful of people in this room, including myself, who have practiced before the FISC. And I, it is, there is no way that that is an accurate representation. I think the challenge for the government is to how do we improve public confidence in a process that at least from where I'm sitting is working as intended and is working pretty well. The FISC has a full-time staff that is very competent. Um, and if I can address the issue of the applications, because I think that's a, something that's out there, a certain number of applications are never rejected. A couple of points. One. If anybody's worked on the criminal side, it's pretty rare that a Title III application is rejected as well. That's just um, the nature of the business because applications are so well put together through an iterative process. But two, in recent weeks, we've started to open up a little bit more to discuss how the FISC process works. And there's something that many of you have probably heard of called a read copy. So before we file a, an application with the FISC, we file effectively a draft application. That can be days, weeks, months before a final application is submitted. And there's an iterative process with the court and with the judges as to what improvements they would require, what improvements they think need to be necessary, and the government takes that into account. So when if a final submission may not be made, and even if when it is made, it pretty much accounts for what the judges would have put in uh, originally. And so it is a legitimate debate as to whether reform should be made, but I, I think it's a canard that the number of applications rejected is somehow reflective of the process, and I just would like to make that point. Any uh, question right here? I will. Um, did you want to? Got to give Anthony yeah. a shot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, mean, but before to, that, let's let Anthony briefly yeah, yes. to the chime in. To, to the extent in which there is a vigorous process within the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, then let's make it real vigorous. Let's have an adversarial process in our legal system. And if you think it's tough for you to practice before it now, I would love to be in front of you, uh, opposite you. I think that's the way our courts normally work. I think the fact is the numbers have not been revealed. I think it's fascinating. Google and all of you co-sponsors of this lovely institute forum are now asking Congress and the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court to release more data on that information. Finally, you understood that your self-interest as corporations aligned with your consumers Privacy interests, congratulations on being late to the party, but good that you got there. And let's, so let's get this information out. Now, I want to go out on a limb, right? Because I've been a little bit watching this. I mean, now that I'm already not on a limb, but let me fall off the limb. Um, <laughs> I've been watching this whole debate about Edward Snowden. Maybe we can goose the question. I think he did this country a service. I have not said that publicly until this point. I think he did this country a service by starting a debate that was anemic, that was left to government officials where people did not understand fully what was happening. I think regardless of where you come out on it, we have now a vigorous public debate. We have six lawsuits that have been filed on the NSA program. We have Congress holding hearings yesterday, finally saying, wait a minute, that's not the law I thought I signed, including the, the author of the bill, Mr. Sensenbrenner. I find it rather 
troublesome when I find that that White House press secretary, Mr. Carney, goes at such lengths to say he's not a human rights activist, he's not a dissident, and he's not a whistleblower. Well, who made him king of the human rights community? Right? I think uh, actually I, Edward Snowden. I, I know, I'm starting I, 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 it out. Excuse me, I can't let this stand without I, I giving I Neil say, McBride, think, who has criminally charged Snowden, uh, that's a why chance to respond. Yeah. I think, I have to say, I think it's a bad message for us to send to people who decide to take the law into their own hands, they're doing a public service. I yeah. think when the, when, the, when the system has not worked, we have sued seven times to try to get this surveillance program for a proper court. We were kicked out of court, the Clapper versus a Amnesty International Court, where Don Varelli, the Justice Department lawyer, said it was a cascade of speculation when our client said, we think our data has been collected by the government. And since we had no proof that we've been surveilled, we had no standing. It has not been for lack of trying, Jay Johnson. Our it courts, has been- The courts are where right. these debates but, belong. Uh, and the only way we can get before the court, the only way we have standing now before this court, is because Mr. Snowden leaked the fact that we are clients of Verizon Business Network. Guess what? Mr. Snowden fixed my standing problem. But Mr. And our democracy, regardless of whether or not you think he broke the law, regardless of whether or not you think he should be hauled to the Fourth Circuit, I think our country is better as a result of the revelations I, of Mr. I Snowden. I think that's, our that's country anarchy. needs a debate. That is not But I do not anarchy. think... That is okay. Daniel Ellsberg. No, this that is, is completely that is, different from Ellsberg. No. This is a kid who had nothing to do with formulating the policy, to, for my lights, is totally self-centered and narcissistic. But anyway, it's not just the information about these programs, much of which was in the public domain. It's a whole bunch of other stuff which compromises ongoing investigations, which I think is way off limits. And one other point, that this guy needs to, to seek public, uh, uh, whatever it is, asylum from other countries because he would be persecuted here is totally nonsense. About, a lot of Americans support what he did. Private, he should come back and face a fair trial. He's been charged, Mannings, but he hasn't been convicted. Private Manning's treatment before he was prosecuted by our government was torture. Now, I want to say that I may not agree. We have yet not decided whether or not we will defend Mr. Snowden. That is yet to be. We'll see if he ends up in a court. We have nothing to do with foreign asylum applications. That he can go find his help elsewhere. But I will say that I am personally grateful that we are now having a debate we should have had long ago. Because we've been doing this for yes. 13, I've been in my job 13 years. I started the week before 9-11. And we have tried to have this very debate all throughout. And we've not had it, we've not had the hearings in Congress that we had yesterday. We we've not had the six lawsuits that have been filed. We've never had standing up until this moment. And we've never had our European allies, now thus many of you are here in the room from British Parliament, I understand, who now also seem to raise questions about whether or not the government intelligence efforts run afoul of the way we interact with our allies. So I think for whatever it's worth, I'm, you know, I think we are better off today, now, knowing about the NSA program, than we were back in March of this year. And so I just want to say that publicly. Do you want to weigh in? I mean, briefly, just to say that, that uh, the case Anthony mentions, of course, is, a, is an ongoing case, so I can't talk about that specifically. What I can say very uh, clearly and unambiguously and forcefully is that the Justice Department does not uh, pursue whistleblowers. That uh, canard has been, um, uh, to use Raj's uh, phrase, has been used, and to use just the one example that Mike alluded to, um, my district prosecuted and convicted a former CIA official last year, an individual who had signed n nine non-disclosure agreements over the course of his career. He was convicted, he pled guilty, he admitted that he outed the name of a covert agent, that he outed the name of a highly classified program. When you talk to people in the intelligence community, many of whom are sitting here, what I'm always told are, is that the most damaging leaks involve outing covert agents and outing classified programs. The, the, the case that we prosecuted involved both. The individual, when he made the disclosure, um, uh, never uh, claimed that he was a whistleblower. That was sort of a self-serving mantle That's that was claimed John, years later. John Karyaku. And but when he was sentenced, the judge, Judge Brinkema, who was the judge in the case, the other case you right. asked about, Michael, yeah. said to him, uh, you know, you are not a whistleblower. Well, you know, we have a patient here. questioner at the, in the audience here who's had the microphone for our, go ahead. Please. I love a good debate. Thank you to the panelists. I, I'm Dixon Osborne with Human Rights First, and the theme this morning seems to be about information, what should be disclosed, what shouldn't, and I want to ask you about a, a slightly different topic, which is torture. 
The Senate Intelligence Committee did a 6,000-page study of torture after 9-11. It's the most comprehensive document <laughs> to be produced to date. Uh, they searched through 3 million documents. There are 25,000 footnotes. But it, though it's been adopted by the Intelligence Committee, it has not yet been voted for declassification. And the reports in the press are that the CIA is pushing back very hard on that. Isn't this something that the American people deserve to know? It, the, the Senate Armed Services Committee did a similar study f uh, for the military's role post 9-11, and that's been made public. But the intelligence community's role has not been made public. Uh, Jay, you want to take a crack at that? Um, I think the answer to the question is yes. I think mm -hmm. that the report that was done by the Senate Armed Services Committee is a very valuable, important report. I personally had a number of takeaways from it vis-a-vis -vis the legal community in the Department of Defense. Uh, I think that the, the legal reviews that were done <coughs> to authorize the particular interrogations at issue uh, were not done in a proper way. I think that the senior lawyer of the Department of Defense should have been more personally involved in conducting those reviews. Um, and so I think that that study is an important, valuable study, and we ought to declassify as much of it as, as we no, can. Any other question over here on this side? And then we'll get to you. Uh, uh, Kevin Klein, I was going to ask Gene, how, how do we ensure a robust debate on public policy issues uh, that involve intelligence operations um, when they're classified within uh, the certain members of Congress. So the oversight committees can't share with the other members of Congress. Well, the tradition has always been that the members of the intelligence committees, which are leadership committees, you don't get on there unless your leader and your party put you on there, uh, were trusted with a lot of secrets that weren't shared with others. The reason for that was, and I come back to this, sources and methods have to be protected. Absolutely. And I, I often joke that Congress doesn't leak because we don't have any information. But actually, <laughs> some members of Congress do, and I was one of those members. Should Congress nonetheless, even with perhaps a higher level of information uh, shared only with the Intelligence Committee, conduct ro robust debates? You bet. And Congress, oops, two minutes, is capable of doing this. Is Congress going to do this in the near term? I doubt it. And I think that is, and that's what Bob Corker was saying. It's a huge ab abdication of responsibility. This is a bipartisan rant, folks. Uh, and it will take uh, a bipartisan group, I think starting with the intel committees, and those folks seem to get along with each other, uh, pushing this thing. Uh, but, but there should be a debate. Somebody suggested maybe we need a National Security Act of 2014. Yeah. Think about that. The National Security Act, which is the framework for most of our security apparatus, was passed in 1947. No business on the planet could operate with the 1947 business model. We changed part of it in 2004 when we adopted intelligence reform. I was part of that. I'm very proud of what we did. It wasn't perfect. It was implacably opposed by uh, Don Rumsfeld and the then chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, so we had to make some compromises. But at least it created a modern horizontal structure over 16 intelligence agencies. Congress should revisit this issue. Congress should be responsible. And maybe out here and, uh, you know, in Washington, in wonderful places like the Wilson Center, I'm totally objective, we ought to start that debate, jumpstart the debate. And Anthony Romero is part of that debate. He knows that. We've had lots of programs where he has participated. We need the civil liberties point of view. We need the point of view of the press. We need the folks who've been in and are in uh, our intelligence committee. We need the public perceptions. And the last point I'd make here is security and liberty are not a zero-sum game. It's not that you get more of one and less of the other. They are either a positive-sum game or a negative-sum game. And if you don't like where we are, let's have another attack on America, and then we'll shred our Fourth Amendment. And that would be a catastrophe. I agree. Um, I, last word, Jay Johnson. I think when it comes to leaks, there really is a big picture point that has to be made. We have a 9-11 or a Fort Hood or a Boston Marathon, and everybody in Washington asks, well, what happened? What failed? How can we do better? Uh, you're not connecting the dots enough. They're all stovepiped. We've got to do a better job of connecting the dots. So our government sets out to do a better job of connecting the dots. 
and then you get a, a Manning or a Snowden and people say, what happened? How can we do better? Where did the system fail? It's because you connected too many dots and you gave too many people access to information. Oh, we got to stop that. And so the pendulum swings back yeah. the other way. The problem is, and then the reality is, and a lot of people probably don't want to hear this, if there's somebody determined to commit a criminal act, uh, if there was a summer intern in my office determined to get into my office, which is a skiff, and, and snatch from my desktop a top secret document and, and, and give it to Mike Isakoff, uh, he'll probably be able to figure out a way to do that and break through all the barriers that exist. And we don't necessarily need to think about changing national security policy in reaction to one criminal event. I think that that person needs to be dealt with in the criminal justice system. And then I'll have to avoid criminal prosecution by Neil. Anyway, on that point, we're apparently we're out of time. I want to thank our panelists for a great discussion and um, to be continued. <laughs>